Right, uh, good morning everyone. Um, I'm Richard and that is Michael over there. We are both from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And it's just the two of us here. We don't have a robot with us at the moment. So I thought we'd just take this opportunity to show you a couple of the things that um, we're working on in our lab just so that you can get a feel for, for the sort of stuff that we do. Um, okay, so we work in the Robotics and Agents Research Lab. It is a, technically it falls under the Department of Mechanical Engineering, but we have students from Electrical Engineering, Mechatronic Engineers, and Electromechanical Engineers from Mechanical Engineering that sort of join together and work on these projects. We're supposed to have a few people from computer science as well, but they don't really want to play with us. And so, yeah, we're a bit lacking on that side. And so you'll probably see that our mechanical side is, is fairly good, but uh, yeah, we could do with some help in the other areas. The University of Cape Town is a really uh, scenic campus, um, <laughs> situated on the rear end of Table Mountain. So this is Devil's Peak and Table Mountain is on the other side, overlooks <coughs> sort of the city bowl of Cape Town, really nice. Um, okay, so first up we have the six-legged robot. Um, this has gone through a couple of generations. This was the first, second, and third iteration of this project. This is generally an undergrad project, final year project, that's uh, taken up every year. And the goal of this is to develop um, algorithms for walking and particularly to learn to walk properly and what happens if you remove a motor or, or remove a leg sorry and leave the thing to figure out its own way in the world um, so current generation we have two different bodies so either the circular or the sort of straight one and we can switch between them run by a fit PC and a bunch of Dynamixel 24 series motors Next we have the SSL uh, small size soccer league robots. So these, this was an MSC project. It was designed uh, according to the F-180 specs and was supposed to uh, com compete in RoboCup at some stage. Unfortunately the funding has kind of been cut and this project has been put on hold and we're focusing more on rescue now. But yeah. It's a, a really nice platform, we've got quite a few of these around. Um, our kicker mechanism achieves near the maximum uh, allowable speed of 10 meters per second. Um, we've got the omnidirectional drive system, about 2 meters per second maximum speed in any direction. Another project is the underwater ROV system. This was brought about in conjunction with the biology department, or zoology. They wanted a robot that could sit on the seafloor and observe things. So first, that was the first prototype that was made. Um, then this one, these two were rated at about a 60 meter depth. It's now been taken a lot further and a lot more funding has been put into it and so this is the third generation that's currently uh, being produced by two MSc students. Also you'll, you'll notice that it's got a unique thruster arrangement so trying to implement vector thrust so the same way as the SSL robots can move in any direction because, any direction because of the arrangement of wheels, this should be able to do the same thing in the water. Uh, so some features. This one is going to be rated at a 300 meter depth. Whereas the previous ones had a central pod with all the electronics inside, this is going to have multiple different sections that you can plug in, so very much distributed. I've already mentioned the vector thrust. I've uh, got a forward facing camera and a downward facing camera. It's going to have a fiber optic tether and so on. Another view with the flotation part taken off got the lights in the front, you can see the thrusters, and then these pods will all house different electronics depending on what we need the thing to do. This is the previous generation one, undergoing some actual tests. Worked fairly well, um, and so yeah, after that they decided to go ahead and make the first. <coughs> Thank you. 
did some actual open water sea tests and yeah, the results were fairly impressive. And then we move on to the last main project on the lab, the rescue robot. This is a picture from Mexico. Um, South Africa doesn't have many natural disasters and the sort of things that we generally associate with urban search and rescue. So while we're developing this in a rescue context, one of the main uses for a robot such as this in South Africa is actually in the mining industry. Uh, so South Africa is heavily into mining and it's quite expensive when things go wrong. So the idea is to, to develop robots that we can stick down there. Firstly, it's <coughs> a, an observation role, checking rock structures, um, making sure everything is okay for humans, and then eventually we would like to replace the humans on the front line and get these things down there instead. So the requirements for that are fairly similar to the rescue scenario. Also rough terrain, we need good manipulation and so on, so it's, it's quite appropriate for us to develop the two sort of features simultaneously. So some features um, are 0.2 meters per second maximum speed. It's not too fast, but it's strong. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of cameras, but some strong lighting. The base alone is about 40, 42, 43 kilograms. Without the arm, the arm is another 14.5 kilograms. We've tested 60 kilograms of payload on the thing, literally me standing on it. Um, and driving it around, which it handled quite fine. And quite impressively, we've been able to drive it uh, up a slope of up to 70 degrees. A rendering of some of the future capabilities. Um, if we were to do something like this, the arm has about a two meter, uh, well, yeah, from base to arm is about two meters. It was designed to um, comply with the entry triangle spec in RoboCup. So although it can extend itself to be quite large, it will still fit between the 24 inch uh, 60 centimeter equilateral triangle. This is a picture from Mexico where it's just come through the entry triangle in the wall. Uh, some tests. So since Mexico, we've done a few more tests. This is the base uh, holding its position on a 60 degree slope and once we put the flippers down it was capable of doing that on a 70 degree slope. Parts of the base, these are all anodized aluminium. They were manufactured in our workshop at UCT. Um, quite a few of those. And then for basic assembly we've got a central spine which gives us uh, quite a yeah, quite a bit of strength in it. and two side pods that form together. We haven't really seen anyone else that, that has done anything like this. Uh, so yeah, components sit inside the tracks over here, they come together and there's wiring up in the central portion. Um, the tracks you'll notice are also very wide in comparison to the width of the body. That's to try and prevent the robot from getting beached on anything. Um, so we've got a very large driving surface area. Just a closer view of one of the side pods, we've got, these are industrial timing belts that we've actually used uh, as the tracks. Motor drums, um, the, the motors to drive the tracks and to drive the front flippers are both contained inside that drum, so it's a nice, well-contained assembly. And yeah, we've got some Teflon skids instead of wheels that the tracks slide along. And also, this portion here is, well, this is the underneath of that portion, and notably we have some, what, well, the tensioning mechanism. So by tightening a series of screws, we can actually force the, we can force tensioners in or out just to tension the tracks. And then onto the arm. Uh, it's a completely carbon fiber, well, carbon fiber and, a, and aluminium assembly. 
got full inverse kinematics to control either the position of the end effector or the position of the sensor payload. In general, we control the end effector and make the sensor payload constantly focus on it. That is all controlled with a 3D mouse. This is just a video of the arm lifting 14.7 kilograms of steel bars. So that's basically the, the mass of the arm itself, and it handled that quite fine. Um, and it will be happy to lift 2 kilograms at maximum extension, which is about 1.7, 1.8 meters. Sensor payload has a variety of sensors. We've got a very powerful 36 times zoom camera, high intensity lighting, thermal camera over here, carbon dioxide sensor in here, and yeah, since this photo was taken, we've also included a box underneath to house the ASUS ProLive sensor. That generates some stuff like this. So my project personally is to do with machine vision for this whole system. And it's not directly related to this, but I have been playing around with dense 3D mapping. Uh, so this is using the PCL uh, implementation of Microsoft's uh, Connect Fusion algorithm. The PCL version is called Kinfu. And so we've been looking at what sort of results that will produce. So these are some dense 3D maps that I created in RoboCup. And I think this is particularly nice in a rescue scenario because you can clearly see that we have a very good idea of exactly what the environment looks like. So I don't envision anytime soon uh, a system where we get this sort of map for the entire environment, but I think it would be nice to, to keep the normal low resolution 3D mapping for general views, but if there's something in particular that you really want to know a lot about, then you could do something like this and hand this over to the rescuer so they know exactly what is surrounding the victim um, and so on. This is just a video of a couple of scans, such scans stitched together. This is the upstairs section of our lab, um, but it really does give some fairly impressive and quite realistic results. How many scans? This was a series of four scans, or possibly six, yeah. So every corner and then two in the middle. How long does it take to get to complete all scans? Uh, the scans, it depends entirely on how much detail you want. The longer you let the, the system look at an object, so you hold the sensor and you move it around and it builds up this image. Um, so the longer you hold it, the flatter walls will get and the, the nicer it will look. But you can generate a scan pretty quickly in a couple of minutes that gives you a very good idea of what's there. Uh, just the longer you take, the more detailed it will get. So how, like this room right here, how long did it take to do all this thing? Um, this was probably about an hour <coughs> scanning, um, because it is, I, I made sure that I, which you can't see here, you, I scanned under the desks and I tried to get as comprehensive a picture as possible. Uh, but if you were to just walk through this, you could probably do it in about five minutes and get reasonable results. The, the thing that took longer was stitching the scans together afterwards because I did that manually, but there are plenty of algorithms that would do that automatically instead. And yeah, that's Thank you very much. So, um, time for a couple of quick questions. Can comment on that? So, the spotters built a uh, prop yesterday to start getting at the measurable features. You know, what we want to start showing is, what's the difference between that chair and that wall? Is that a passageway? Or in a more complicated way? Is the collapse ceiling to the floor? Or what's the rubble on the floor? So, that uh, prop that they built has some features in it. And in order to get that kind of detail, we might have to employ some tricks to just shine that light almost everywhere and see what that is like. Uh, so we're going to practice that today. Yeah, we can do that. Um, yeah, so the idea with that is um, well, our, our live image coming off the robot while we're driving has a live 3D view into which we've projected the, the sort of the width and the height of the robot and the path 
so that we can see exactly the size of obstacles. I've implemented a measuring function, so we can measure sort of the width of a doorway or see whether the robot is going to fit. But that's just an instantaneous live view. And then, yeah, whenever we want to do something seriously detailed, then we can switch over and just pan the, the head around and, and get sort of more intense scans like that. Very cool stuff. Okay, so um, we take a very, very quick break and then um, we head into the first, into the closing keynote.